I, I know that if you have been coming to the church for a while, you will notice, or I've made comment, like, I can't see, I can't see. <laughs> so I went to the eye doctor the other day, and uh, I, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm just having a little bit of trouble seeing, I just wanted to check my prescription, and guys, this is what he said to me. Well, as an older woman, <laughs> pray for him, pray for him. He's not okay. Like he, yeah. <laughs> it's like he did not just say that. What? As an older woman. Anyways, um, yeah, sweet sixteen. I was telling Luke this morning, like I still feel twenty six. Like that's that's the age I think I am, twenty six. So we're twenty six and holding. Anyways, um, last week. Uh, Joan and I were in Fisher Lake, Fisher River. I was calling it Fisher Creek, and so I was trying not to go there. And uh, we were in Fisher River um, with, um, with a bunch of women doing a women's conference. It was absolutely amazing. And now Fisher River are also part of our family, so we pray for them. They're probably watching online, so we love you. We had such a good time. It was about nine hours away. Yeah, about nine hours away, so it was lots of driving, but it was a wonderful time. I want to talk to you um, this morning about something that I believe that a lot of us are going through. Um, but first, I'm going to read from Ecclesiastes 3, in verse 1. Well, first, I'm going to pray. <laughs> Jesus, we were singing this morning about how much we love your presence and how much we love you. And if your presence doesn't go with us, we don't want to be there without your presence. So thank you. Thank you for always meeting us, for always being there, for loving us, even where we're at. For caring so much, for being our shepherd for leading us into green pastures and knowing when our soul needs restoring and being that for us. And when we walk through valleys that seem like death, that you're our strength in that. That you walk with us, you don't leave us. That your mercies are always new for us when we fall, when your grace abounds towards us so that we can walk strong and do the things that you have called us to. Jesus, we love you and we love your presence. Speak to us this morning. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now I'll read Ecclesiastes as I wait for my reading glasses to come in. <sighs> Darn it. Ecclesiastes 1 says, There is a season, a time appointed for everything, and a time for every delight and event or purpose under heaven. There is a season, it says, for everything. And we know that we have natural seasons. We have spring and summer and fall and winter, and every single season in the natural is important. Um, Joan was just talking about this when we were away, and she was referencing Aaron, who had given an example of talking to his son, who was so excited um, in summertime for winter to come. And he was explaining to him that it's great that you're excited for winter to come, but fall has to happen first. And Joan gave an example, and I am not, I'm going to ruin this example, but you'll get the, you'll get the idea. She was talking about there were these trees that were hundreds and hundreds of years old, big, beautiful trees, and produced fruit, and so they decided that they were going to try to skip seasons so that they could get more fruit out of the tree, out of these trees. And causing them to skip the season actually caused the trees, these hundred-year-old trees, to die because of a skipping a season. 
every single season has a purpose. And every single season we need to walk through. Whether we want to be in that season, like I don't want to be in winter. I like summer, I like fall, but winter, you know. So we have these different seasons that we need to walk through. Now, if we continue in Ecclesiastes, it goes on to talk about the different seasons, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search, a time to give up as lost, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear apart, a time to sew together, a time to keep silent and there's a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. So it's listing the different seasons of things that we go through and knowing that, that there's a timing for everything. And just as there are natural seasons, there are seasons in the spirit that we go through as well. And each of those seasons are necessary for us to walk through. I, I, I took a course about six months ago that talked about the different seasons of things that we need to walk through. And so I'm going to list them here for you, and we're going to just talk about one today. This is the six seasons. There's a dry season, a waiting season, a grinding season, a testing season, a warring season, and a rejoicing season. And each one must be walked through. But the one I want to talk about today is a testing season. And I, I, I'm talking about this particularly because I feel like there's a lot of people that are walking through a testing season. And if you're not, listen up, because it's coming for you at one point in time. And I'll explain to you why testing seasons are necessary. But we walk through testing seasons, and they're actually ordained by the Lord. And so in Psalms 11, it says, the Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the ones who, who love violence, but the Lord tests the righteous. There are signs that you are walking through a testing season, is that you are met with trying conditions, hard conditions and you feel like you're backed into a corner. The battles that you can expect when you are in this season is actually a lot with yourself, and the battle that you are fighting is one of obedience and your attitude. Obeying what God is saying in this season, and what is my attitude in this season. And the work that God is doing in this season is he's working on your character. In 1 Peter 1, it says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Anyone ever felt grieved by various trials? <laughs> Lord, stop this. <laughs> it says, So that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes through, or though it is tested by fire, may be found in result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus. And then in James 1, uh, verse 2, which is one I know that we've heard many times, it says, Consider it nothing but joy, my brothers and sisters. Whenever you fall into various trials, be assured that the testing of your faith through experience produces endurance, leading to spiritual maturity and inner peace. And let endurance have its perfect results and do a thorough work so that you may be perfect and completely developed in your faith, lacking in nothing. 
That verse always reads so nicely until you're in the middle of testing. <laughs> Consider it joy. You just want to slap somebody when they tell you that, right? You're like, I'm really going through a hard time. Well, you know what the Bible says? Consider it joy. Get out of here. Get out of here, Nellie. But it says this, there's a promise and it says, be assured that the testing of your faith through experience, it produces endurance and that endurance leads to spiritual maturity and peace and peace. Know that the testing that you are walking through right now is actually maturing you and it's bringing you inner peace. Isn't that crazy to think that something you're walking through that feels like no peace at all <laughs> is producing peace in your life? I want to I talk about, oh, I missed one point, what to expect or what is expected of me in the middle of testing? What is expected of you in the middle of testing? Three things, to meditate, to apply, and to obey. Meditate on the Word of God. Meditate on, on the words that He has given you, on the promises that He has given you. Apply the Word of God to your life. Sometimes it's going to feel directionless. Your job is to, what, what, is, what is the Word of God saying right now? Apply those things to my life and to obey when He speaks. That's what's expected of you. Okay, so we'll go to Genesis 22. And we're talking about Abraham. And Abraham, for those of you that don't know Abraham, he is one of the fathers of our faith. But Abraham believed for a son. God had given him a promise that said, you're going to have a son. And there's a lot of things that happened in between that. But Abraham was old, old, old when he had his son Isaac, but God had fulfilled this promise for him. And so he had this boy named Isaac, who he loved like crazy. Can you imagine believing for something for all of your life? And then finally you have this thing that God said, I'm giving to you. And so he's got his son Isaac. And then we come into uh, chapter 22, verse one, it says sometime later, so Isaac has grown up, it's sometime later, Abraham received the promise, and sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called, yes, he replied, here I am. I can imagine, like he didn't know what was coming on the other side of that. Abraham, yes, Lord, <laughs> here I am. And then God says to him, take your son, your only son, Yes, Isaac. He's like, not Isaac. Surely not Isaac. God's like, yes, Isaac. Whom you love so much and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. I can't imagine Abraham in this moment. This is what I've believed for. It's what I've trusted him for. It's the blessing the Lord has given to me. And now he's asking me to lay it on an altar. So then in verse three, it says the next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and he took two of his servants with him along with his son, Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God told him about. And then on the third day of the journey, Abraham looked up and he saw the place in the distance. That, that, that one sentence gets me when I read it. And then he looked up and he saw the place in the distance, meaning the time has come. And I think you think of, of Abraham, and he sets out on this journey. Isaac doesn't know. Servants don't know. He knows that he's like, okay, God, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe you. I'm going to obey you. And he's walking with Isaac, and Isaac means son of joy. No, son of laughter. And so I picture Isaac, he's telling jokes to his dad, and, and Abraham's kind of, <laughs> but you know, 
in Abraham's head and his heart is any moment. I'm going to have to lay this down. And he's walking. I picture him looking for any place, like any moment you're going to come through, right, God? Any moment this changes, right? And he's looking. Nothing. There's got to be a ram. Nothing. And then I wondered if he's like, is there another way out of this? Is there a road I could grab Isaac and run? But shoot, God's everywhere. <laughs> There's nowhere for me to go. And savoring every moment they're walking. He's, and then it comes to the place where it says, and then he looks up and he sees in the distance. The time has come. Imagine his heart was breaking. But then in verse 5, it says, stay here with the donkey. Abraham told the servants, the boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulder while he himself carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them walked up together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, <laughs> yes, my son. We have the fire and we have the wood, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? I just, I can't imagine Abraham in that moment. God will provide, he says, a sheep for the burnt offering. And they both walked on together. I think in this moment, you see that there's a strengthening of Abraham's faith. Even in this moment, God will provide Isaac. I don't know what this looks like. I don't even know how this ends. But, but God will provide. And strengthening is taking place in Abraham as he's walking through this test. So then it says, when they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar. And he arranged the wood on it. I picture him arranging it very slowly. <laughs> Just waiting, okay. <laughs> then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood, and Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. And at that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham said, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from him even your own son, your only son. Abraham, in the middle of not even understanding why he was in the places that he was, chose obedience. He chose reverence. He chose the fear of, the, of God. It says, then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham named the place Yahweh Yaira, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use the name as a proverb on the mountain of the Lord. It will be provided. What happened in, in Abraham, even in this moment, is now he recognizes something new, another, another piece of who God is. He says, oh, he's Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. Suddenly, he'd walked through testing something so significant that suddenly he declares, well, God is provider. And I think Abraham had seen God as he's the one that, that fulfills his promises. But now Abraham sees him as provider. Have you ever walked through something where someone has said, hey, God healed my body. He healed me. He's healer. And you're like, okay, yes, because you said God is healer. Because the Bible says he's the healer. But when you've been healed in your own body... Suddenly, it's different. It's like, no, 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 I know 
I have walked through something so significant. I can now stand in front of you and say, God is healer. Or you've had addictions and, and you walked through those addictions and, and God showed up and he delivered you from it. And you boldly stand in front of someone and say, I know he is the deliverer. This is what's happening with Abraham in this moment. He's walked through a testing so significant that he just chose obedience. He chose obedience. He chose the fear of God. He chose to lay down what God was asking him to lay down. And suddenly he says, now I know he's provider. This changes everything in our lives when that happens. But then look at this. It says, then the angel of the Lord called him again to Abraham, called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says, because you have obeyed me and not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number. Like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. You understand that this time of testing that Abraham walked through was generational. He, he was walking through a testing in his own life that actually brought generational breakthrough. I know I've taught this before when we talked about the fear of God, but you understand Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. And there is a scripture later on where Jacob, Isaac's son, refers to Isaac as the fear. He refers to his father Isaac as the fear of Isaac. In other words, Isaac had a fear of God. Where did Isaac get his fear of the Lord? By watching Abraham lay everything on the altar for God. That fear that he had, that Abraham had, Isaac watched, my God, or my God, my, my father will obey God no matter what. That spread to Isaac so that Jacob one day, when he became a man, said, my father feared the Lord. It's generational. And understand that when we are walking through testing times, when, when God is testing us, it's not easy. Nobody likes tests. Even if you know what you're doing when you go into the test, nobody likes them. But there's something that's taking place that God is doing it on purpose to get you to where you need to go. And there's blessing in it. So things to remember in times of testing that God is still there, that he doesn't leave you. In 1 Peter 4 in the Message Bible, verse 12, I love this. It says, friends, when life gets really difficult, don't jump to conclusions that God isn't on the job. We always do that. Like, where are you? Why aren't you here? He's there. Instead, be glad that you are in the very thick of what Christ experienced. This is a spiritual refining process with glory just around the corner. I don't know who needs to hear that. You're walking through something very significant. God is still on the job. And you are walking through a spiritual refining process, but glory is going to come out of that. Our faith is a spiritual pathway to a, a relationship with God. And when our faith is tested, our relationship with God is often tested. And not that God moves away or, or lifts his hand off of you or anything like that. But oftentimes when you're walking through testing times, what it reveals about you is usually what you believe about God. I've walked through many, many times, and I know you have too, but where you walk through things, 
And suddenly in your heart, there's things that are exposed in your own heart of what you believed about God. You didn't know they were there because in the good times, you're like, God is great. <laughs> and then when things, when pressure starts to happen, there's things in your own heart that God actually brings to the surface to say, hey, that's not actually who I am. I don't know when you started believing this, but that's, that's not, that's not me. Obedience. No, I just missed my part. God is never the source of tribulation. He will allow us to walk through hard places to cause a strengthening to happen. But always when we walk through hard places, he is what sustains us. He's the one sustaining us when we walk through it. Isaiah 43, 2 says this. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they won't overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. You will walk through them. But I won't allow it to destroy you. He's the one that sustains us in those times. Another thing of what to expect is obedience seems to always be a key part of God's testing. He'll give us things to do that make no sense and aren't particularly appealing to us, although they are good for us. And then he watches our response to learn exactly how we feel about our relationship with him back to our responses in those things of what we believe about who he is. When we trust him, we typically obey him. When we don't trust him, we typically don't obey him. We typically disobey. So it's a refining process that's even causing our trust in him to grow. I know that in this season, there's been many times where I'm like, wow, God. There are things in me I didn't recognize were there. There are places beyond me that you are calling me to go that are causing me to increase my trust in him. And he calls us to those places. I love this one. It prepares you for the next season you're walking into. We go back to the seasons we can't skip times of testing. Listen to this verse in Judges 3, verse 1. These are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars in Canaan. He did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites who had, not previous, who had no previous battle experience. So these Israelites, they didn't know how to fight. The descendants before them did. They were warriors. And so the Lord begins to test them in this. Why? He says he did it so that he could teach them. So that he could prepare them for the next place that they were going. They, they didn't know how to fight. They didn't have what was needed in them for the next place that they were going. So the Lord tests them to get them ready. To prepare something in them for the next season that they're going into. Oftentimes when you are in times of testing... That's what the Lord is doing. He's, he's producing something in you. So everyone here has a call on their life. Everyone here, God has, God has given purpose. And some of us even were like, I've got big visions. God's shown me big things. But know this, to get to those big things, there are seasons you're going to walk through. That God prepares for you so that when you get to the big thing, I don't want to say big thing. When you get to what God has called you to do, he prepares you. He puts you in times of testing so that it produces what's needed to get you to where God's got you going. Does that make sense? So I love that. I love it. It says that 
He did this to teach the descendants warfare. God wants us to welcome testing. In Psalms 26, verse 1, it says, Vindicate me, Lord, for I have led a blameless life. I have trusted in the Lord, and I have not faltered. And then he says this, Test me, Lord. Try me. Examine my heart and my mind. For I have always been mindful of your unfailing love and have lived in reliance on your faithfulness. So he wants us to welcome his testing. A person who is truly in pursuit of a great walk with God will want to be tested. <laughs> Times of testing will teach you. They'll teach you about things about yourself that you didn't know were there. Things that you had, have never realized in times of comfort. It's in those uncomfortable moments that you begin to realize what's going on inside of you. It will teach you what you believe about God, and it will teach you obedience. Even Jesus went through times of testing. Hebrews 5.8 says, Although he was a son, he learned obedience through the things he suffered. If Jesus had something to learn, how much more do we? Times of testing will change you. Seasons of difficulty allow for a type of forging to occur. As you pass through the fire, you're formed and you're strengthened in a way that can only happen in times of trial. Some of the most beautiful people with the most wisdom are ones that have walked through trials. Lots of them. <laughs> You can remain in the same cycle of brokenness and dysfunction for your whole life if the pattern isn't changed. And so seasons of testing come to break up those patterns. Tests allow things to be revealed and refined by the glory of God. And then we are to embrace the season that we're in. Sometimes when you're going through a test, it's difficult to recognize it's a test until after you have walked through it, and then you recognize that you have just walked through something significant and you have been changed. That you walk out and you realize, I can't go back. I'm not the same person that I was. I've been changed. The best thing that you can do when you are walking through a season of testing, is to focus on what is the next best decision according to the Word of God that I can make. And is this decision one of obedience? What is the Word of God saying? I, I don't know anything else going on around me, but what is the Word of God saying for my life? Am I following Scripture? Am I meditating on it? And I'm obeying it. Meditate, apply, and obey. I'm passing the test. Passing the test. The right approach to times of testing is to obey whatever the Lord is asking of you to do. No matter what it costs you. Obey in that moment. Obey, what are you asking of me, God? What are you asking of me? Even if this costs, even if this hurts, I'll obey. That's how you pass the test. Obey.
like Abraham, didn't understand. This makes no sense. What if you don't show up? What if I make this decision and you leave me? What it, and we try, to see, we try to see beyond. But in the times of testing, what's in front of you? What's he asking of you? One foot in front of the other, obey. I don't know anything else, but I'm going to do what I know. I'm going to hold fast to the word of God. I'm going to apply that to my life. And I'm going to keep obeying. I'm going to keep surrendering. I'm going to choose reverence. In Matthew 26, this is my last verse. I think of Jesus getting ready to go to the cross. And he's praying to the Father, and he says this. We know this. He says, Father, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. He says, and he goes a little farther. He falls on his face, and he prays, my Father, if it be possible, please let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. We see Jesus having this moment in this time of God, Father, if there's any way, if we could get away from this, if there's any other way we could do this. But then he says, but nevertheless. your will. Nevertheless, your will. And so I, I bring this knowing that there are many of us that are walking through. And I think there's many of us that are maybe like Abraham, not that it says that Abraham was doing that, but my, my mind goes there of if there is some out of this, I'm taking it. It's too much. It's too painful. When I come this morning to tell you that he's preparing something in you, I know it's uncomfortable. But it's the season. It's just a season. You're in a season. A necessary season of him making and molding something in you. Not because he's mad at you. But because he loves you. His, the Bible says he's the potter and I'm the clay. He's molding right now. So cutting away of some things that has to happen. And good is going to come from this. You're going to come out of this like Abraham, declaring the goodness of God. Declaring who he's been to you in this time. And I came to tell you that you're not alone. That he has not left you. This is so common. Every time you walk through this, you begin to think, did, did he leave me? He has not left you. You're walking through fire. You're not going to be burned. Keep walking. Keep surrendering. And then for some of you, it's this. There's a coming back to the place. You, you've almost like stopped dead in your tracks. Like, God... I can't, it hurts. But would you come back to this place like Jesus did? Father, I've come to realize I don't think there's any other way. <laughs> so, nevertheless, not my will. 
I trust you, not my will, but yours. Can we pray that this morning? Father, we feel your love this morning, that you would come and comfort your people, (laughs) comfort us, those that are walking through a testing season, to remind us that you are right in the middle of it, loving on us so big, (laughs) actually bringing more out of us, because you are our creator. You know how you created us. And you know the plans and the purposes that you have for us. And so by your design, even though it hurts, you're actually loving on us so much. I thank you for comfort. Father, this morning, for those that have really struggled in this season, that you're surrounding them with your peace and your comfort and the promise to know that joy, joy comes in the morning. They may weep at night, but your joy is coming. And then, Father, we say to you like Jesus did, Not our will, not our will. Jesus, Father, not ours. We may not understand, and we may not know how this all turns out, but not our will, yours. We choose yours. We choose surrender. We choose reverence. We choose the fear of the Lord. We choose to keep walking forward, obeying you. Not our will, but yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.